It's fantastic to be here in Queensland, even when it's raining, and um, great for this to be my first time on the Cedar stage in 2020, uh, just down the road from the Darling Downs where I grew up. Um, so really enjoyed listening to the speakers this morning. Um, and if I was to take a couple of things out of uh, what, they've, what they've spoken about, uh, and again to Peter, Peter and Michael's point about one word, um, two words, uh, trust, and confidence. Um, confidence and trust, really important uh, to our prospects this year and to our economy and society. Um, and in turn, the stories that we tell about our economy and society um, are really important to trust and confidence. And part of the reason that I know this is because in addition to reading the economic and political overview over my break, I also read an interesting book called Narrative Economics. And in that, uh, they have shown, uh, neuroeconomists in fact have shown in experiments, um, that dramatic narratives increase levels of oxytocin, also known as love hormones, uh, and cortisol, uh, also known as the stress hormone, uh, in the listener's bloodstream as they're listening to these um, stories. Now I have to say, when I was listening to Kate and I saw that um, chart of uh, both the ethics and competence, um, my cortisol levels uh, felt like they were, they were rising. But at this point, I should also apologise um, unreservedly to anyone in the room uh, who has um, a serious neuro occupation or qualification, um, because economists, as they do, will, will latch on to anything that looks like real science to try and boost their credibility. So let me just apologise right there. Um, but on a more serious note, if we cast our minds back through the last 60 years uh, in which CEDA has been in, in operation, I think we can draw a lot of trust and confidence from Australia's economic narrative, despite the odd dramatic episode here and there. After all, our economy has tripled in per capita terms over that time, uh, and incomes have grown about two and a half times. Um, a record proportion of Australians are in jobs and those jobs are a lot safer. Life expectancy, it's increased by more than a decade. Uh, and 85% of secondary school students complete uh, high school now, compared to less than a quarter uh, back in 1960. And as you may have heard me say before, we've achieved all of this with a unique brand of economic development. We've shown remarkable resilience to global economic shocks, while at the same time taking advantage of globalisation and the growth that we've seen in Asia. And our economy and society has been underpinned by strong multiculturalism uh, and immigration. And we've done, we've managed to do all of this uh, with a strong social compact and sharing prosperity. And I'm proud to say that CETA has been a part of some of the important debates on these issues. Uh, CETA was issuing studies on the Southeast Asian uh, economies when Australia was just waking up to the importance of engaging with Asia uh, in the 1960s. And in the 1980s, CETA's research on uh, immigration won support from both the Fraser and Hawke governments, setting the stage for points-based skilled migration. And we have been long-term supporters of income tax relief for lower income earners. But, as we said when we released the economic and political overview yesterday, if ever there was a time not to take Australia's economic strength for granted, it is now. Our brand of economic development needs to evolve. It needs to evolve in an environment where the, some of the traditional economic relationships just aren't holding, and where we find through, for example, CEDA's surveys, that uh, less than half of people feel that they are benefiting from economic growth. And we need to evolve so that we can uh, have major technological advances are not just things that we see and feel, but things that show up in productivity uh, and wages. We need to evolve to address stubborn issues uh, that threaten social cohesion, like the 700,000 people, uh, including many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, who find themselves in persistent disadvantage, underlined this week uh, with the Closing the Gap report. And we also need to evolve, I have to say, to connect more women to prosperity. Women who are underrepresented in senior roles, 
get paid less on average, have less super on average, and still do more housework, according to the latest HILDA study. And we need to make the shift to convert emissions targets into more action on decarbonised growth, as Martijn Wilder argues in the EPO report. And finally, as former uh, Productivity Commissioner Peter Harris argues in the report, uh, our ageing population demands structural reform uh, for, aid, for not just the aged care industry, um, but for the compact between generations. So CEDA's approach uh, to economic development is captured in our policy stack. Uh, five areas that are absolutely critical uh, to our future. The first is technology and data. And economists and technologists are in broad agreement that it will be one to two decades before many of the emerging technologies uh, that we see today become general purpose technologies right through our, every corner of the economy. And I find that interesting, particularly given Kate's observation this morning that the community doesn't feel like that. Um, the community doesn't feel like this is slow uh, at, at all. Um, and as I speak to many uh, CETA members, uh, people are really facing challenges not around the availability of technology, but driving change uh, in their businesses and having the capability to change systems and integrate technology. Um, our Chief Executive, Melinda Salento, uh, started a conversation on public interest technology in 2019, uh, and in 2020, we'll continue that. We'll start with our first report of the year in May, unlocking data in the public interest. Now, data is the fuel for many new technologies, some, um, some even suggest uh, it's the new oil. Um, others suggest it's the new uranium, something that you can extract value from, uh, but it can also be radioactive. We'll be taking a closer look at the emerging policy frameworks for both private data and public data in Australia. And that includes asking whether we've got the balance right uh, to ensure that data encourages competition, helps consumers and informs better public policy and service delivery. And perhaps most importantly, the question is how do we maintain community trust so that data doesn't, in fact, become radioactive? And the benefits of technology and data can only be realised if we have engaged and collaborative workplaces and workforces. And I think Kyle's already alluded to this, um, but we are seeking to have a joined up conversation with a broad range of stakeholders on this one. This is not just about workplace relations, but education, managerial skills and competence, organisational culture and communication. And despite the critical role of the growth, composition uh, and geographical distribution of population, it's an area that hasn't really had uh, considered debate and discussion. In line with CEDA's legacy, we contributed uh, to that debate in 2019 with our uh, report on temporary migration. Our research found that recent waves of migrants since the advent of temporary skilled migration uh, have not harmed the local workforce in aggregate. We still made a number of recommendations on how the temporary skilled migration system uh, could be made to be more stable, more transparent and more efficient while maintaining critical safeguards. In September 2020, we're going to flip that issue uh, on its head and ask whether we are realising the economic potential of permanent migrants uh, in our report, Skills Mismatch in the Permanent Migration System. Now, many of you, most often in a taxi or Uber, will have met recent migrants with incredible, often in-demand technical qualifications they are not using. Deloitte Access Economics has found uh, in Queensland alone, there's a $250 million cost to the economy. So we're looking forward to assessing the national scale of this issue uh, and the steps that government, business and the education sector can take to address it. Of course, the population debate has often intersected uh, with the community's priority on affordable, quality, critical services. Services like health, aged care, energy, justice and water. And despite everything we know about the megatrends that are staring us down in these areas and the exponential increases in demand, we're still playing catch up. Our community pulse research in 2018 um, demonstrated just how these uh, views and sentiments around service delivery are intertwined with how we feel we are experiencing uh, economic growth and our trust in governments to, to deliver for us. So we'll probe these issues again in our second survey in, in 2020, seeking to gain new insights uh, on these priorities and, and get a bit deeper in some of these uh, areas and, and the 
respective roles that people see uh, different sectors of the community playing in that. And finally, there's the critical role uh, of institutions in economic development. And in this, we include everything from uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia, regulators, the parliament, uh, all the way down to trusted local institutions, universities, hospitals, businesses. Um, the glue of our economy, if you will. Uh, and it's about some of these groups working together in ways that they haven't before to solve some of our biggest challenges. And one of these challenges is entrenched disadvantage, characterised by persistent poverty and multiple forms of disadvantage for around 3% of Australians. We published the first of a series of planned reports in 2019, arguing for action across the Federation uh, to try and unlock data and analytics to make sure that we can bring earlier, um, better coordinated and connected services for those at risk of falling into this serious form of disadvantage. Um, that report also urged the Commonwealth Government to upgrade the safety net, increasing New Start and the Commonwealth rent assistance. Um, in Nove November 2020, we'll explore in further detail uh, how we can continue to unlock data, analytics and navigated service delivery to address this challenge. Um, and we will continue to do a series of reports uh, in that area because it is just so complex uh, and so stubborn in its nature. Um, of course, CEDA's strength, and I think, I think Kyle's already alluded to it today, is in our diverse membership. And so I look forward to um, getting out and speaking to as many people through the year uh, as we pursue our research agenda. Um, so if anything I've spoken about today strikes a chord with you, if anything I've spoken about today you disagree with, um, please come up and, and say good day at the end of proceedings. Um, otherwise, connect with me on social media. Um, unlike, unlike PVO, I do need followers. Um, so always, <laughs> always sympathetic, always happy to have uh, people do that. Um, you can also jump on the CETA website uh, and download any of our past reports and also get a sense of what's coming up uh, in 2020. So just in conclusion, um, I started by talking about the fact that the stories we tell about our economy and society really matter. And despite the global economic uncertainty that we heard about this morning, the rise of populism uh, and the short-term economic headwinds, I think Australia still has so much to play for in lifting uh, people's living standards into the future. And we can do that if we get the long-term uh, policy settings right. I look forward to the role that CEDA will continue to play uh, with your support in putting the critical long-term issues, um, the evidence and the solutions front and centre in the policy debate. Thanks for your attention.